All right, Dinesh, shall we, uh, uh, shall we get started? Yes. OK. Uh, do you see my presentation? I see it. OK, great. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining our session. Uh, I'm Dinesh Joshi, and uh, I have with me uh, Joey Lynch. Uh, and today we are going to talk about uh, towards practical self-healing distributed databases. A uh, little bit about me. I'm a uh, senior software engineer at Apple, and uh, Joey um, can introduce himself. Uh, but we both are Apache Cassandra committers working on the Cassandra project for, for a while now. Hi, thanks, Dinesh. Uh, yeah, so my name is Joey, and I'm an engineer over at Netflix on the cloud data engineering team. Um, and I basically wrangle databases of varying forms. Uh, so Cassandra's one of them. <laughs> cool. So <clears throat> today, um, we'll be uh, doing a few things. Um, so we'll introduce you to the problem space. Um, we'll talk about the goals of a self-healing distributed database. and <clears throat> We will uh, look at some of the large scale operations when we run a database. And then we propose a self healing architecture and talk about how we can safely experiment in production uh, with this architecture. And finally, we'll talk about conclusions and our future work. So um, let's get started. Um, running a database is hard. So if uh, people have ever tried running a database, uh, which is a stateful application, uh, they know that um, running a database is, is difficult in production. But running a distributed database is even harder because the, the, there's more difficulty in uh, the problem space and the, the failure modes are very esoteric. So um, the current uh, the distributed database, uh, you know, uh, operations require uh, a lot of manual intervention and it's a high touch activity um, requiring uh, intervention from the SIEs, ops folks, and uh, developers at times. Uh, there are some new autonomous databases that are coming up uh, in the research space, and uh, they are not yet fully uh, at a point that uh, the industry can adopt them at scale. And it is difficult to migrate to these new autonomous databases because the data model and uh, the 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 database uh, response characteristics are very different uh, from the existing databases. So it's not a trivial task to take your existing system that's serving hundreds of uh, petabytes of data and then move it over to um, a new autom autonomous database with, uh, which requires a full rewrite of applications. So <clears throat> with that said, uh, I'm going to talk about the goals of a self-healing distributed database. Um, the goals are basically to uh, self-preserve, which means that the database has to function in the uh, event of a failure uh, within the system. So uh, that is the primary goal of the database and to avoid oscillating states. So what that means is if the database detects there's a problem, it tries to fix the problem, but that should not keep ping-ponging between two states, um, and um, which in itself is a problem. And then the system has to be explainable. So when you get a call at 2 a.m. as a uh, SRE or an operator of the system, you don't want to dig around too many places and look at what the uh, issue is. Uh, you want the system to be very understandable. So these are three main goals of a distributed database that is self healing The non-goals, these are specifically things that we are not going to try addressing. Um, basically, the system does not handle all types of failures, and it does not magically tune itself. So it's not one of those uh, systems where we observe the metrics and then we try to tune the, the database. That's not the goal of the system. 
we can leverage machine learning, but uh, not at the expense of understandability. Uh, people who have worked with machine learning know that the machine learning models, while they are useful, they are very difficult to understand at times, and, and our system needs to be more explainable. So let's dive into what, uh, what, what is the difficulty in uh, running these uh, large-scale systems, right? So <clears throat> the primary uh, difficulty is in software management. Software is constantly changing, and, uh, and we need to keep that software updated. And any sort of update activity is a disruptive activity to your uh, database cluster. The second is configuration management. Things change over time, new data gets added to the database. It's a database management system. And so you need to constantly keep um, uh, tuning it. Uh, and configuration management is, is key to that. And uh, hardware is constantly degrading. So hardware does fail over time and we need to keep replacing instances in the cluster. But also, uh, hardware gets updated over time. There are newer CPUs on the market. There's expanded memory, uh, more per high, higher performance SSDs that get added. And so you need to just, you know, in, in, uh, in situations, you need to just update to a newer hardware footprint. And uh, the, the, there is difficulty also in, in another dimension is to understand the system, you need to collect effective telemetry. So you need to understand what the system is doing when it is doing it. And finally, the system, when it detects a uh, issue, it should page an on-call. And uh, this, is, uh, this is crucial for the continuous operations of any system. So uh, what, what are we really talking about here, right? Uh, with all of these activities, uh, we're talking about risk. And uh, what, what we see on the slide is a uh, graph that models um, the uh, risk. And it models it in the uh, using metric, um, which is uh, mean time to failure. Um, and as the, you, what you see is the, the failures uh, are going to increase uh, exponentially. This uh, graph is a log scale. So uh, it, it, it displays the the criticality of uh, you know um, of handling risk or mitigating risk. Any form of change is a risk, and the bigger cluster that you run or more nodes that you run, the risk increases dramatically. So what is this risk, right? Uh, so whenever we make any changes, online changes in Cassandra, which involve changing uh, settings via JMX or custom tables. Um, they, it involves risk. So this is usually done for database. Uh, also, at times, we use it for reconfiguring Cassandra. Um, so Cassandra doesn't need to be taken offline in order to configure certain parameters. These are called hot props in Cassandra. And then there are offline changes that we do, uh, which are uh, YAML-based uh, changes. And uh, this involves taking the instance offline. When we take an instance offline, it is an inherent risk uh, to the entire cluster because now you have uh, traffic going to other instances in the cluster, which may increase by 30, 33 uh, percent at times as well. So uh, the the idea here is that um, any any offline change is going to cause the instance to be unavailable, and uh, and this is something that we need to do because you know sometimes we need to update the kernel. Uh, sometimes uh, we need to update the runtime and other systems, right? Um, including updating Cassandra. And then, like we talked about earlier, uh, hardware upgrades um, re also require us to take that instance offline because the, 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 the instance has to be moved from one har physical hardware to another physical hardware. So <clears throat> let's uh, look at the self-healing architecture. How does it try to solve some of these uh, issues and mitigates risk. So the self-healing architecture is a whole goal-driven architecture. And what that means is uh, we are going to set explicit goals for the system. There are specialized agents, and we will see what those agents are, but these are agents that are uh, primarily uh, specialized in a specific domain, and they're running on uh, the nodes in the system. There's a component card Cluster manager. This cluster manager allows the cluster to uh, um, to heal itself when 
identify that are issues. Um, and it really is a facilitator rather than you know, a system that is controlling the cluster. And there is local and global decision making in this architecture. What that means is that uh, individual agents can make local decisions. And if they want to participate in a global decision, they can uh, do that as well. And the system is constantly trying to converge to a good state. So that's, uh, that's those are the uh, main components of a self giving architecture. So now let's look at how this uh, architecture look, will, will look like. Um, so um, in this architecture, uh, what we see is that there are these nodes. These nodes are individual Cassandra nodes. And here we have three nodes, N1, N2, and N3. And each node has a specialized agent, some agent that is running on this node. Uh, and this agent internally, if you look here, it has it understands the state of the node. So it, it observes what the current state of the node is. It also understands what the node's goals are. So that there are a set of goals that it has to uh, achieve, and there is a state, uh, some state that it reads um, and it understands. And it reports these, uh, the state back to uh, the system, but uh, based on the, the goals and the observed state, the agent can potentially take uh, some action on the uh, on the cluster or uh, sorry on the individual node and at a higher level there is a state machine here that is always transitioning from one state to the other so when the state is observed to be a certain state the node is going to uh, the agent is going to try to transition the node to another state that is uh, provided as the node goals and at a higher level we have a cluster manager which is across all the nodes within the cluster and this cluster manager has world goals, which means it has the cluster-wide goals uh, programmed into it, and then it has the state of the world. So it understands what the what the state of the world currently is, and it is also doing the same thing. The difference between the node and the, uh, uh, the agent that is running on the node and the cluster manager is that is has a higher level view, whereas the node uh, level agent has a fo single focused view, which is the scope is the node. Um, of that agent. So what kind of agents are we talking about here? So there are hardware agents, uh, software agents, and system reporting agents. And uh, these, as the name suggests, they are specialized to handle hardware uh, or, or the system uh, reports. Uh, and agents can uh, rapidly react to local stimuli. So much like a human's uh, um, uh, nervous system which senses an input and then it reacts to it. Uh, similarly, these agents um, react to um, the the state uh, of the of the node, and they make local decisions. Uh, together, these agents are going to cooperate to make a global decision via the cluster manager, and they constantly converge to the goal state independently. Um, and when they can't uh, get to a good state or they can't find a state a transition that is applicable, they will for page a human being. And the natural question arises, so why do we have domain-specific agents, or why do we have specialized agents? Right? Uh, these agents are easy to understand and debug. Each agent author gets to pick uh, the ideal implementation. Uh, so you're not stuck writing an agent in Java uh, if, if Oh, did we lose Tanesh? Oh, all right. I guess uh, I will message Tanesh offline, and then I am going to restart the presentation. Give me one second.
Hey, uh, did did you all lose me? Yeah, we lost you. Okay, um, sorry about that. I think uh, my internet has been flaky. Um, I'm resharing my screen. Um, so sorry, where, where did we lose? Where, right, where did I... So you, uh, next okay. slide. All right, so domain specifications. Uh, so they are easy to understand and debug, and each agent can be composed uh, or written uh, in a different language that uh, is ideal for the problem space. And uh, they are easy to compose, uh, which means if each agent is has a single responsibility, then uh, that those agents can be composed into a, 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 a into a system, and uh, which means that there is a higher um, level of re reusability in these agents. Uh, so what works for, uh, let's say, Cassandra or a distributed database like Cassandra doesn't necessarily uh, you, you don't need to use the same exact agents. Um, and uh, so it brings brings in composability into the system. So I'm going to hand it off to Joey to talk about uh, the, the next uh, section. Uh, Joey? All right. Thank you, Dinesh. Uh, so we've heard uh, kind of at a high level how we want to try to structure the self-healing database. Um, over the next couple of slides, I'll, I'll take us kind of through progressively more complex examples that uh, show you how we can actually do that. And the very first step of any self-healing system or any declarative system is to write down what you want. So uh, here you can see a goal description for a given Cassandra cluster. Um, and you can see that that goal is broken down into, into three main parts. So the first one is we have, des we have desires or goals about what software we want to be running. So uh, what is the base operating system that we'll be uh, installing on top of? What are uh, the sidecars or other processes that have to run next to the database? Uh, what is the configuration, either YAML or other, uh, that we need for that database? <clears throat> then we have hardware, which is uh, our desires or our goals about uh, kind of scale or shape. Uh, so for example, we might want to run large cluster or smaller cluster. Um, and, uh, and, and then finally, we have high level system desires or goals, uh, things like uh, how much money are we willing to spend on this cluster? Uh, what are our target SLOs in terms of service level objectives, in terms of like latency or availability? <clears throat> uh, and then the final aspect of this goal document is that it is parameterized by environment. Uh, so a pretty important part of uh, goal-based systems is that we can set those goals at a fine level. So for example, we can set the goals for a single node or for a rack of Cassandra machines or for a cluster uh, or for an entire environment like production or staging. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, let's say uh, that we've set some goals, like some latency targets or uh, for a given Cassandra cluster to be uh, running and let's kind of work through uh, kind of every element of the of the goals that we need. So at the very lowest level, we're we're going to need to enforce goals for our hardware. So for example, here uh, we can see a very simple startup uh, supervisor agent, uh, which runs a really simple disk burn-in check. Um, and in production, uh, essentially what this is doing is it's enforcing a goal about our hardware's uh, capabilities before we even start the database. Uh, in, in here you can see it's something very simple, like using a a uh, direct IO um, DD command that does uh, maybe one gigabyte of read and one gigabyte of write uh, to a disk to, to, a, to assert that that disk can meet the latency requirements that we have. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, but it's not enough just to check that hardware is meeting our goals when it starts. We also have to continuously assert that our hardware is meeting our, our goal specifications. Um, and if we're running on Linux, we get a lot of great tools out of the box for assessing the state of the world on that node to see if uh, we are meeting our goals. So for example, we can find out if the disk is throwing IO errors uh, through dmessage. We can find out how long uh, IOs are spending uh, being serviced by the disk versus queuing waiting for the disk using uh, disk stats. Uh, or we can even look into how long are our Cassandra threads waiting to run on a CPU. And uh, this information is all uh, really useful uh, to be reported to that cluster manager uh, to be able to make uh, larger, larger decisions. So for example, uh, if you are seeing that a disk is taking one or two seconds to service IOs, the only possible remedy is to ask the cluster manager to, to terminate yourself um, because there's no way that you can run Cassandra successfully. 
Uh, conversely, if you see in schedule in sketch that that uh, th that your threads are not waiting for a CPU, it doesn't matter how much you scale up that cluster; it's not going to get faster. Um, because if you add more CPUs, it's you know that's not it, it, the process itself is slow, not that you're waiting for a CPU to run on. These are a little bit more complicated than those startup checks, but we can see how we can kind of use the same mental model of thinking about like, okay, well, what's our goal? And then we assess the state of the world. And when they're not equal, we take action. Uh, next slide, please. But why do we, oh, uh, but why do we even care about uh, goals at such a low level? Um, yeah, next slide. I wanna be seeing the, is she still there? Okay, yeah, this is good. Uh, why hardware agents? Uh, so the reason why we want hardware agents is because we have to assess that our goals are meeting their, uh, that we're meeting our goals at the lowest level in order to meet the highest level. So for example, if we want a two millisecond 99th percentile guarantee at the client, we're going to need a one millisecond 99th guarantee at the database. Next slide. And in order to achieve a one millisecond at the database, we're going to need a 100 microsecond uh, goal to be met at our disk or our network level. Uh, so, so building up a goal-based system really starts with that lowest level, and then we build up. Next slide, please. So let's see uh, how we can build up. Uh, the next step up the stack is going to be our uh, specialized software supervisor agents. Um, and the simplest goal-based agent you can think of is this process supervisor. So the goal is uh, my Cassandra database is running, and then the observed state of the world is, is either running or it's not. If it's not running, I'll start it. If it is running, uh, I, leave, I leave it leave it be. Um, but you can actually take this a step further and uh, actually supervise your, uh, your Cassandra JVMs as well. Um, and you can establish goal uh, throughput. Uh, so how much time your Cassandra database spends running application code versus garbage collecting. Uh, you, you presumably want that to be a pretty high percentage. Uh, how many of you out there have ever seen a Cassandra database enter a GC spiral of death? Um, I'm, I'm imagining that a bunch of people are raising their hands. Uh, it happens sometimes in Java databases, especially uh, when a query comes in that asks it to load the entire data set into memory. Uh, but in order to automatically recover from those and self-heal, we have to be setting goals about that throughput so that we can actually see when the database enters that uh, bad, bad scenario and can remedy it by, uh, for example, taking a core dump and restarting the database or killing the database. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, but we can take it even further. So both of those previous ones, again, don't require any coordination or any real use of the cluster manager beyond please, please terminate me. Um, but we can actually build even further and look at system-wide or cluster-wide orchestration uh, using this goal-based system. So for example, uh, we can set goals about our continuous backup process. We can, we can say like, you know, we desire that every file on disk is synced to our backup as of some, you know, uh, delay. So for example, like a, a 10 minute uh, point in time backup should be taken every 10 minutes, um, but we only want to upload the deltas. Uh, or we can also use the same for hardware or software replacement, or even for something super complex like a uh, distributed repair where we're, where we're repairing the entire data set coordinating through the cluster manager. Um, and all of those we can phrase in terms of uh, our goals and we can take actions in terms of state machine. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so let's let's dive into a couple of concrete examples of how to build those state machines. <clears throat> and to do that, I just want to cover uh, really quickly the, the a difference between uh, what we call imperative control planes, which are very hard to scale and very hard to make self-healing, and declarative control planes. Um, imperative control planes are uh, what I call SSH in a for loop. So, so how many uh, Cassandra operators have written a bash script that SSHs to every Cassandra node and runs some node tool command? Uh, I'm raising my hand. I'm assuming a lot of other people are raising their hand um, because it's a very easy thing to do, but it doesn't scale. And it doesn't scale because it doesn't build in failure. So you don't know when SSH can't reach that node. Did it execute the command? Did it start executing the command? What state is it in? Um, there's no way to know what's going on with your system. And so then you have to write a second SSH script, which just checks the status of the first one, and then the second one, uh, and you end up with turtles all the way down. Whereas on the right-hand side here, we have a declarative-based system where the only thing the control plane is allowed to do is write into a highly available database, I want this state transition. And then all the nodes uh, individually are going to constantly uh, pull that state, compare it to the state of their node, and make transitions like Dinesh mentioned. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, and within the node, uh, we're going to follow a really simple algorithm. We're going to assess the state of the world, and we're going to assess the goal or desired state of the world. And when those aren't equal, we're going to compute a path. Um, and we're going to compute a path to the desired state that tries to minimize downtime. Next, next uh, slide. And the reason why we want to minimize downtime is because we want to prefer maintenance that doesn't require us to take that availability risk. But if we do have to take that availability risk, we're going to try to do that maintenance as fast as possible. So if we have a cluster of 100 nodes spread across three availability zones, uh, or Cassandra racks, uh, we're going to try to do maintenance uh, a half rack at a time so that we can have uh, a mixed mode state, which is very risky for a database because uh, mixed mode states are the least tested. Um, so we want to have that risk for as little time as possible. Uh, and it turns out that if you look at that paper earlier, uh, the math says that whether you do maintenance on a 100 node cluster one node at a time or half a rack at a time, it's the same risk to your availability. Uh, so you should just do it fast. And then finally, uh, when you do need to coordinate, you use the cluster manager. Next slide, please. All right, so let's do a concrete example. Let's do a software upgrade. So uh, in a single environment, let's say in this case, the production environment, we're going to upgrade our Cassandra cluster to 4.0 alpha 5. Next slide, please. And, uh, and, and so we set that desire, uh, we set that goal. Now the upgrade agent, which is running on all our Cassandra nodes, is going to see that the running version of software is not equal to the gold version, and it's going to begin our upgrade state machine. And one interesting thing about the upgrade state machine is that uh, it inherently has to coordinate through the cluster manager, because a lone node can't know if replicas in another rack uh, are already down. So you can see that uh, the very first step of our state machine is going to be acquire a lock uh, through the cluster manager, which is just a, a lock is just a state machine with two states. Uh, acquire a lock that allows you uh, to do maintenance. Um, obviously, uh, it's something that I haven't put here, but at all times, you need to have your Cassandra database provisioned with enough excess capacity for maintenance. So that means that you should be able to survive an entire uh, rack failing at any given time or an entire replica set. Um, at Netflix, we have a separate set of agents uh, which are continuously reporting information about our capacity. Um, and then we have like an offline process for uh, if we're under capacity. So our maintenance systems don't have to worry about that because they can just assume that we have enough capacity. Uh, so first we acquire the rack lock. Uh, and then we enter, uh, if you were seeing the keynote earlier, Jonathan was talking about, uh, you have to actually gracefully drain. You have to wait for clients to drain off. Then you have to pull yourself out of gossip. Um, and then finally, you're ready to do the software upgrade. And uh, we like to do software upgrades in a self-healing system with atomic state transitions. So we boot into an imager. Uh, next slide, please. And the imager will actually reach out to an image repository. If you're running EC2, you can pull AMIs. If you're uh, running in Kubernetes, this is like a pod spec or like a, like a set of containers. And uh, you're going to boot into the new image if you can. And if you can't get the, the new image, you're going to reboot back into the old image um, and then uh, restart the database. And you can kind of see an, an, uh, a key insight as a developing here, which is every one of these state machines has to deal with failure and success. So unlike that bash script where you implicitly were only dealing with the happy path, uh, when you phrase your agents in terms of st distributed state machines uh, and, and you actually draw out these state transitions, you force yourself to actually think about like, okay, what happens if I can't get the, the new image? What happens if I can't pull that? Well, I have to boot into the old one. What happens if uh, for whatever reason I can't boot into anything? Um, well, then you have to, 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 to terminate the, ask the cluster manager to terminate yourself. Next slide, please. And uh, that was an example of uh, kind of like, I would say uh, a slightly advanced maneuver using a distributed state machine, which is a distributed software upgrade that did require downtime. So we had to coordinate through the cluster manager. Uh, now let's do a really fun one where we actually do state transfer as well. Uh, so in this one, we can see that the operator has declared a desire for a new um, or a goal for a new hardware type. Uh, so maybe you want more disk space or uh, somebody came along and said, hey, we bought a bunch of these new computers. Can you guys move your Cassandra databases onto them? Uh, so, so that's what we're gonna do now. Uh, next, next slide, please. And to do that, uh, we have to do something kind of interesting, which is we actually have to start with asking the cluster manager to help. Um, so, and, and this is because the agents on a single node, they can't make new hardware exist. Uh, they can't make it join the cluster. They can't make it be available. <clears throat> so the very first step is each agent is going to basically ask the cluster manager, um, you know, essentially I'm waiting for a buddy. I'm, I'm waiting for an, an, a new node of this type to exist. Um, and then the cluster manager uh, will reach out to your control plane API, be it Kubernetes, be it, uh, be it uh, EC2, and ask it to launch some nodes. <clears throat> 
And then simultaneously, your old nodes and your new nodes now enter two separate state machines that cooperate through the cluster manager. Uh, next slide, please. So let's start with the leaving state machine, uh, where we can take advantage of, uh, the par of, of the disturbing nature of Cassandra. And we can actually do uh, this entire process in parallel across all of our old nodes. Um, so what we see here on the slide, wait for new nodes uh, to, to show up, uh, start checkpointing our state into our uh, consistent backup system, uh, be it S3, be it GFS, wherever we're keeping our backups for a database. And then finally, our nodes uh, will start advertising that they're ready for replacement. Uh, by We call it advertising a token. Uh, you can also think of it like a shard or just generally like a data set, a piece of data that's on a physical node. Um, next, next slide, please. And once we advertise the token, we're going to enter the part that has to coordinate through the uh, cluster manager. Um, so just for brevity, I'm just going to cover the happy path here, but you can see that, that there is a sad path that, that has to be programmed for each possible state transition. Um, but generally speaking, an old node is going to advertise a token. Uh, it's going to buddy up with a new node. At that point, we take the database down. Um, so there are some pending mutations that have happened since the consistent checkpoint uh, that we now need to sync. So that's uh, so we enter the sync delta phase. Um, after we sync deltas, we're going to do a full data checksum using XXHash for speed. Um, if you do SHA-256, it's going to take forever and you're not going to do checksums. Um, but if you use XXHash, you can actually get it done in like no time at all. Uh, so you're going to verify that the data on the old node and the new node are byte for byte identical. Um, and then finally, you're going to transfer ownership from the old node to the new node. And then the, the leaving state machine will enter a termination state. It'll ask the cluster manager to help it by terminating. Um, because its job is over. It's transferred its token. It's transferred its ownership of data. Uh, next slide, please. And we can look at the joining state machine for the kind of uh, other side of the picture. So we saw kind of how the leaving node works. Um, on the joining state machine, we can also have all of our nodes that are joining in parallel uh, uh, acquire a pending token, so buddy up with one of those old nodes, and then sync that node's checkpoint uh, down to disk. And the key for why we're going to do that is twofold. Uh, the first one is because we can do it massively parallel. Um, so we can do all of our nodes in our Cassandra cluster simultaneously. We don't have to worry about like, oh, well, we're going to put too much bandwidth pressure on Cassandra or like uh, streaming is fast or slow. Or, uh, so for example, in Cassandra trunk, streaming is quite quick, but in Cassandra 3 or Cassandra 2, streaming is very slow compared to uh, the native, native hardware capabilities. Um, but this is actually really key because we're exploiting the inherent parallelism of the, of the self-hailing distributed state machine. All of our new nodes are pulling from the backup simultaneously. And then only once they pull that consistent snapshot, do we wait for, uh, for, do we wait for our buddy to stop. Next slide, please. And then, uh, and then once we uh, wait for stop, <clears throat> uh, and we wait for our buddy, that's when we, we start looking like that software upgrade, where uh, one half rack at a time, uh, nodes are going to stop Cassandra. And if we remember in the leaving state machine, the stopped Cassandra is uh, syncing deltas. So the new node has to receive those deltas. Um, and then uh, we're going to verify checksums. Uh, so you can see that this is mirroring the sending uh, node. Uh, and then finally, uh, we receive the token um, via the transfer. And uh, unlike the leaving one, which terminates, we start Cassandra. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think that's that, that kind of uh, describes it end to end. Um, <clears throat> and we can see how we're building up these progressively more complex distributed state machines, um, but we're always leveraging the same basic architecture. Um, and we can actually take it a step further and use this to uh, provide any arbitrary maintenance tasks. So for example, you can use this architecture to uh, run repair on your Cassandra cluster. Uh, your, your repair agent just observes the repaired state of the node and compares it with the desired repaired state. Um, and then you just run through the distributed state machine as described in the uh, open source Cassandra 14.346 ticket, um, which is reproduced here. <clears throat> um, but I, you know, to kind of wrap up, I, next slide, please. I think what we've been able to see here is that no matter the type of maintenance activity that you have to do uh, on a distributed database, you just follow the same basic steps. So number one, instead of doing the thing you want to do, write down what you want to do. Write it down in a database, write it down in a state machine, uh, you know, just write it down in a database in a highly available store. Then number two, program your agents on every machine to follow the same identical distributed state machine. Um, it is a little bit harder to, to write because you have to actually think about those failure modes, um, but it ends up with uh, an inherently parallel system instead of an inherently serial one. So it's a very fast uh, maintenance activity, which lowers that risk that we were talking about earlier. Um, and then finally, if you ever find yourself needing to communicate, 
do so with a state transition rather than a synchronous message. So you'll notice that earlier in the like the hardware replacement one, I didn't say that the new node and the old node are going to send each other an RPC. Um, instead, they uh, record a state transition, like I'm waiting for a buddy, or I've acquired a lock, or I'm acquiring uh, my my uh, my destination node. <clears throat> So a key insight there is that the only form of communication is going to be through those state transitions. Um, and, and yes, absolutely changing from an imperative uh, programming model to the declarative programming model required by a self-healing system is hard. Um, just like if you're used to writing synchronous code, it's hard to write asynchronous and concurrent code. Um, but, but we found that it's the only way to make our systems truly robust to failure because it forces you to program in those failure edge cases. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Dinesh for, uh, so I, I kind of explained how we can use self-healing systems to make changes. Um, Dinesh now will cover a little bit about how we can know which changes to make. All right. Thank you, Joey. Uh, hope I'm audible. Um, so let's talk about safely experimenting in production. And I have one sentence answer to that. There's no way you can experiment safely in production. <clears throat> so, um, so let's see what what's the next best thing that we can do. So, uh, the next best thing is that we need to emulate production first. And in order to do that, uh, we can copy the cluster's goal document to a staging or test environment, and the self healing system should restore it from backup. And once the system is restored, what we can do is capture live traffic from production using FQL. Uh, in Cassandra 4.0, we have uh, FQL, which is uh, full query logging, and it allows us to capture the traffic. Um, and or we can use something like Harry, which is a um, which is a uh, system that's used for fuzz uh, or property based testing uh, to generate synthetic queries. Uh, based on that, uh, what we can do is modify the configuration that we want to experiment. So let's say if your configuration is C, we move it to C Delta um, by changing some stuff. And then that new configuration is applied uh, to this experimental setup. And then we apply load that is matching your production query distribution or synthetic queries that you generate and you throw at the system. And we can run chaos agents to simulate real world failures like pulling a node offline, um, causing network jitter, packet drops and stuff like that. And if the if the system um, you know, survives, uh, which you can tell by uh, waiting for the test to run and observe logs, metrics, and errors or increased latency, but depending on whatever your goals are, you can actually observe the system in, 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 um, in motion. And if it survives, then what we can do is we can uh, make this change in production. When it comes to rolling this out, um, we need to make sure that we don't roll it out all at once. So we use uh, live control interfaces that we talked about earlier to change this uh, setting if it is possible to change in, using a hot prop uh, in, in production. Uh, we change it to a, on a single node, observe it, and progressively roll it out to a whole rack, a whole data center, and the next data center, and so on and so forth until uh, the change is roll, uh, rolled out to all the instances in production. And all the while, we need to observe metrics. Um, this ensures that if there are any failures you stop, you can roll back the change uh, that you just made. So uh, there are a bunch of conclusions and future work. Uh, what we talked about here was a concrete architecture that is based on control theory. Uh, it is uh, it, it, it's rooted in some very uh, well uh, uh, you know uh, fundamentals of computer science like state machines um, and and it makes the system a lot easier to understand um, also to uh, track changes across the across the nodes uh, uh, is, is easier with the system and um, we can apply the self-healing uh, properties to a real world production database. Um, and a small set of cooperating agents are, that's all that is needed along with uh, a cluster manager. There's no large scale central planning that is necessary in this uh, system. And uh, the, the machine learning models are harder to explain and understand. So we kind of stay away from uh, jumping on that bandwagon right now. And uh, eventually what we could 
sometimes we do is if there is a log of all these state transitions, you could take the state transitions and uh, apply um, anomaly detection, or uh, you can use that to uh, predict failures uh, because it is very uh, crisp data that, that the system will generate. And then finally, uh, this is a general approach to uh, any distributed system. So if you want to apply this to, um, let's say, Elasticsearch or some other distributed database, which is um, running on a bunch of machines, uh, this approach is also uh, generalizable. Uh, so that's the, uh, those are the uh, conclusions and, and uh, direction in which we can take this. Um, so finally, uh, we are hiring. If anybody's interested in uh, working at Apple or Netflix, uh, please follow the links on, on, on your screen. And uh, uh, there, there are a bunch of uh, open positions. Uh, and uh, we can we are, we are open for questions now. Um, I have to hop off to uh, my next session, but Joey uh, can answer, uh, answer the questions. Uh, thank you all for joining. Thank you, Nash. All right, so uh, if anybody has any questions, I guess just put them in the chat maybe, um, and I'll hang out for a couple of minutes. Or also feel free to reach out to me on Apache Slack. I don't see any questions. I will hang out for a few more seconds. All right, it looks like uh, we don't really have any questions. So uh, in that case, let's head over to Dinesh's next talk, uh, also in the Cassandra track. And uh, thank you all for uh, coming and watching. All right, yeah, I don't think there are any questions. Okay, I'm leaving. Bye, everyone. All right, uh, I've been told that there are questions, um, but I can't see them in chat. So I have uh, somebody who's sending me uh, screenshots of their chat so that I can see what they're saying. Um, all right, so uh, there's a question uh, about, are there any open source agents or cluster manager available which can do similar things? Um, so Netflix has open sourced uh, various of the agents. So for example, we open sourced our, Net our, our Priam uh, agent, which is a management sidecar. It does like backup and restore and, and uh, internally repair. We, we have that uh, open source ticket for open sourcing the uh, repair, uh, the repair uh, agent as part of Apache Cassandra sidecar. <clears throat> um, that works ongoing. And uh, we've open sourced, for example, like JVM Quake. So you can attach the JVM supervisor to uh, your Java process, be it Elasticsearch, Zookeeper, and rescue it from garbage collection death spirals. Um, a lot of the agents are already open source unrelated to our company. So for example, like, um, you know, system D that's just, or whatever uh, net system you use. Uh, and then in terms of software upgrade and hardware, uh, that's not open source right now. Uh, we did open source our, uh, so at Netflix, we call it our cloud. Um, I think it's, I think it's, um, I forget the name, um, but it's an open source project uh, that allows you to image EC2 instances in place. So you can take a, AMI, uh, and you can actually like flash, uh, it's called a S3 flash bootloader. Um, it's on our Netflix Skunkworks GitHub. Um, and you can use that to uh, image an EC2 machine from one known state to another known state. Um, and I think that there are a preponderance of Kubernetes operators that are open source right now. And I think the main issue there is just, we don't have one consistent one. Um, so, uh, 
Yeah, in, in terms of cluster manager, uh, we've we've often found the cluster manager uh, is is something that companies want to write themselves uh, based on uh, like their own uh, control plane service. Um, so uh, you know, in the case of like repair service, we used the, the database itself as the cluster manager. So so uh, we communicate state transitions through like a system table. Um, that's because we didn't have a sidecar yet. Um, now that we have the sidecar, we could potentially use that uh, using state stored in the database as the cluster manager. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I guess I guess the the short answer is various agents are open source, various agents are closed. Uh, the, the the cluster manager is really uh, you know something that your operations team is going to define. Um, it's very similar to like a Kubernetes operator. All right. Um, is this work related to the Apache Cassandra management process, step one, or separate work? Um, so I would say that this work kind of motivated uh, from our perspective, uh, our per involvement in step one. Uh, so, so specifically, there was a lot of questions of like, well, can you open source like the cluster manager? Um, and we really kind of see the Cassandra open source sidecar uh, as, kind of as kind of hosting uh, a lot of these um, state machines for you. But like, for example, uh, state transition, like hardware migration is very uh, environment specific. So like, for example, in at Netflix, we use S3 for backup and we uh, we have consistent snapshots in S3 that we can sync uh, or we have EBS volumes that we can attach. Um, and, you know, similar concepts exist in Google. Uh, so you have like GFS uh, in, in Google Cloud. Um, and and most on-prems on have some equivalent of like a blob store and a disk. Uh, system, um, but interacting with those, like like writing that glue, is actually most of the work. Um, so we're not really sure how to uh, properly. We, we, basically, we can we think we can get the state machines, but we'll have to have plugins for like actually doing the state transfer. Um, all right, so those are the two questions that they've sent me. Let me ask. Technical difficulties. I'm now being told that I'm on mute. 